So we've been talking about the different kinds of evidence for the theory of evolution. And one of the easiest ways to see evolution uh, at a qualitative way without getting too complicated is actually looking at the geographical distribution of species across space and time. We call this biogeography or the study of the distribution of patterns of biodiversity, the kind of stuff that Darwin looked at to actually see uh, evolution taking place. For example, when he went to the Galapagos Islands and he saw that the types of finches and the types of tortoises and the types of iguanas seemed to match the environments that they were living in. And similarly, this can be found all around the world. You see different kinds of bugs, for example, in different kinds of islands. You see different kinds of of reptiles and different kinds of islands. You see different kinds of animals in the in this family that is like that includes the armadillo, the ant ant eater, the pangolin, and and the spiny ant eater in different continents because they all came from the same original animal that used to be there when Pangaea was there. But then when they all split, they actually created different kinds of animals because they were isolated in different environments. So patterns of biodiversity show you that evolution is causing changes to the uh, animals that share common ancestors, which you can tell by things like DNA research, homologous structures, vestigial structures, mosaic structures, and things like that. And so you can use the same kind of concept, for example, even for microbiology studies. Uh, Protists and bacteria are sometimes more common in certain areas. For example, malaria is endemic to Africa and other tropical uh, locations. Uh, virology studies as well, the bird flu, the swine flu, the uh, avi Asia, Asian flu, some of these things that were came from specific locations around the world because that's where the virus had the right conditions to evolve. Likewise, uh, fungus are specific to certain places around the world. So mycology studies, botany studies, some plants are specific to some kinds of world. You're not going to have the same kinds of plants that you have in the rainforest, than you have in the boreal forest, than you have in the desert. Uh, you're not going to have the same kinds of animals in different places. So studying the flora or the fauna, you can actually see patterns of diversity. And it's very hard to argue against those patterns and also hard to argue that these animals could possibly have not evolved since those environments were not there in the beginning. Since we have no evidence that the, 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 the climate has always been the same. On the contrary, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that because of plate tectonics and millions of other reasons, including changes in the solar system, changes in ocean currents, changes in Earth orbit, changes in uh, precession, all of the changes of volcanic eruptions, all these kinds of things can change the actual oceans, can change the actual climate, can change geology, can change the entire environment. And so these animals were not around before because the environment was not around before. They could not have survived. The tolerance levels were not allowed them to live through the ice age that went, the earth went through. These animals evolved after, after this environment actually showed up. So this patterns have changed throughout time, like we talked about in the natural selection video. So biogeography is one of the greatest pieces of evidence to actually prove evolution. But if that's not enough for you, you can also look at actual evolution. And that's one to actually finish them all, to actually hit it in the, you know, nip it in the butt. You know what I'm saying? And be like, after this, it's kind of hard to deny it. You can actually see evolution happening. Um, Microevolution and even macroevolution, arguably, have been observed in the laboratory. Now, we're going to talk about macroevolution versus macroevolution in the last video of the lecture series. But for now, what I want you to know is microevolution is changes in the genetic composition of a population over time because of environmental pressures. Now, look at example here. You see that the uh, HIV virus can adapt within a person to become resistance to medication now the virus itself one viruses does not adapt what it's doing is that future generations of the virus adapt to the medication and become immune to it basically all right or resistant to it you're not even really immune but like the bat that basically the drug no longer works on the virus why not because the virus mutated and it changed it became more common because the viruses that were not uh so immune or not resistance to the drug all died off leaving behind only the resistant virus that's evolution and we actually seen plenty of examples of virus mutations that's why you gotta get a vaccination for flu every year because the virus for flu is an RNA virus that's constantly mutating and so 
mutation of viruses proves that evolution actually happens. Uh, it's kind of small, Mr. Lima. Can you go bigger than that to see me something like a little bit bigger than that? Well, sure. Think about, for example, uh, bacteria, a little bit bigger. You get a bunch of bacteria and you blast it with uh, antibiotics. Then, you know how it says it kills 99.9% .9 of the bacteria? Well, at least 0.1 of the parts of bacteria left. The thing is, though, after you used it, that 0.1 becomes all you have left. And it will grow and develop, and you're going to get a population that only has the resistance of bacteria. At which point, your original antibiotic no longer works. That seems like a pretty big deal to me. And in fact, in, if you go back to the beginning of the 20th century and you went to the hospital with some sort of infection, you got a penicillin shot, it will kill 90% of what was out there. Now, it's more like it only kills about 50% of the, of the diseases that people came into the hospital with. What has happened in the last 50 years is that we have used penicillin so much that it's actually grown uh, resistant strands of the bacteria that cause diseases. And so the more antibiotics we use, the more we actually cause our ultimate demise because we eventually all that's going to be left is bacteria which is resistant to those drugs, which adds pressure to scientists and medic doctors to actually find new kinds of antibacterial uh, medicines to kill those resistant bacteria. And this is a serious problem for medicine. Likewise, when you actually spray pesticides and you actually spray... Um, antibiotic resistant foods, when you actually change your, uh, the, your fertilizer, every, when you go to the hospital, when you eat different kinds of foods, and we are creating new kinds of antibodies in our body, new kinds of antibi antibiotic regimens. When you put all of that together, society as a whole is creating immunity over the simple kinds of bacteria, which is going to leave behind only the bad types. And then we won't be able to defend ourselves against it. So it is possible that in a few hundred years, humanity is going to be in deep problems to kill these bacteria unless we can continue to advance in medicine to the point of finding cures for these things. Um, one idea that people actually have is to stop using antimicrobial agents altogether. Look at before, for example, here. If you use the on the right side, if you use the antimicrobial agent and you wash your hands, okay. Um, with water so your hands are going to be clean in fact your hands are going to be very very clean and you might leave some of it behind maybe one or two bacteria there behind the point one but most likely your hand because you use the water the hand is going to be clean but what happens to the groundwater that's washing away into antibacterial soap well in that groundwater all that's going to be left is going to be the resistant strand of the bacteria so what you're creating over time is what we just described uh, immune bacteria basically now if you use a waterless agent okay and that means you're not actually putting uh, the you're not washing your hands you're not putting antibacterial uh, regimens back into the water level drain what's going to happen is that uh, your hands are still clean but the groundwater is not affected so that's going to reduce the formation of resistant strands out there in the environment and so if you're going to use antibacterial agents, try to use the ones which do not require to wash your hands because you're, you're only immunizing the bacteria on your hands. And that doesn't cause as much problems as if you were to actually add the antibacterial soap, which actually goes to the groundwater and then makes that a problem. So, But remember that even if you do that, you still have the pesticides, the hospitals, the new kinds of fertilizers, the new kinds of, of growth, the new kinds of, of plant-resistant uh, plants which are genetically engineered to resist uh, things like that. You have new kinds of antibody immunity being developed, putting pressure, selection pressure on bacteria to evolve. So even if you do this, we still have problems in the future. Now, but this is yet another example of microevolution in place. It's evolution, people. There's no arguing that evolution happens because we've seen it. It's happening. Now, that might not be good enough for you. I need a bigger example, Mr. Lima. Fine, let's do a bigger example. So we did a real experiment here, and this has been done to actually prove that evolution can happen at the macro level. Um, look, for example, if you have two natural pools with guppies and their natural predators in them, one pool has killifish, or, and they will, but killifish will eat mostly the small guppies. 
The other pool has um, pike, uh, cich cichlid fish, which eats mostly the large guppies. Okay, so while the pool up here is basically going to have larger guppies at sexual maturity. Why? Because all the small guppies will tend to die off, leaving the only the guppies which are large to reproduce. So in this pool up here, pressure is going to create larger guppies. On this pool down here though, since all the large guppies get eaten, the small guppies are the only ones that survive to have children. And because of that, you're going to have basically uh, more small guppies on this pool here on the bottom. Now that in itself is already a correlational study where you're seeing a correlation between the uh, size of the predators and the, and the change in the prey. Because you see uh, the difference between the sizes in the natural pools. But to actually make this in the control experiment, if you were to fish out some of the guppies from the, the, the pool that's over here, that's going to have the small guppies, and you throw them to one of the pools up there, where you're going to have the killifish, all right? But there was no guppies there originally. You're adding the guppies to the actual um, pool. And remember that killifish likes to eat those small guppies, right? So what's going to happen is that the biggest of the small guppies are going to start becoming more common. And you should theoretically see an increase in the size of guppies after time. And that's exactly what happens. You see, the blue line here represents the original size of the guppies. By the way, female guppies are larger. That's why the, the, the female bars are, are bigger, okay? But either way, and that's, by the way, is an example of sexual selection. We'll talk about it in the next chapter. Sometimes there's a difference between the, the genders because of different selective pressures that exist between them. Now, either way, the male guppies and the female guppies that on the control pool were smaller sized then the guppies, after 11 years in the new pool that you added them to, they weren't there before. What happened is that the guppies on the new pool had to grow up across generations. Because if they didn't, they would be eaten more often by the killifish. And so this is showing you that evolution can actually take place and that the guppies actually change across generations because of exposure to environmental pressures where the small guppies get selected against and the large guppies get selected for. So that is an example of evolution actually happening. And so it's really hard to argue against these things. And we did even more examples of this when we talked about the natural selection lecture, like the um, peppered moth example, like the pesticides with bugs. There's a plenty of evidence of evolution actually happening. All right? Um, We'll talk more about this on the next video. See you guys then.